Hi, and welcome to our video on populations. As we continue our unit on interactions, we're going to begin to move through levels of biological hierarchy that are greater than the individual. And we'll start with populations. A population is simply all of the individuals of one species in a particular area. And that area can be as big or as small as we want it. This image of starlings represents the population of starlings in this field ecosystem. That's one population. Here's a different population. It's a picture of part of the population of locusts in an area. This, of course, is historically a bit of a trickier population for humans to deal with. Locusts are closely related to grasshoppers, and they're probably most famous for a stage in their metabolism where they move from being solitary insects to being the gregarious form. They group together and swarm throughout a particular area and do what herbivorous insects do, eating all of the vegetables that they find along their way, including human crop plants. This has historically been a tricky thing for for human populations to deal with when locust swarms are in the environment. Some solutions have been relatively dramatic, like this image from Palestine in the 1930s of individuals using flamethrowers to control the locust population. Modern methods of locust control tend to be a little bit more refined than just burning them all, but at the same time it illustrates that population biology is something that's not only important from an academic standpoint, it can have real-world consequences for the human population as well. In this video, we're going to be talking about how populations are structured. We're going to discuss population dynamics and look at the two major models that we use to understand population growth, the exponential model and the logistic model of population growth. Then we're going to look at how we describe and measure populations before we spend a little bit of time talking about one particularly unique population, which is the global human population. In order to get a handle on population dynamics, let's go back to our bird population and let's consider that as a particular unit. That bird population is going to have dynamics that are leading to an increase in the number of individuals in the population and a decrease. Increases in the number of individuals in the population come from birth and possibly from the immigration of individuals from other populations. Decreases are going to come from deaths and from emigration of individuals from that population. Considering the effects of those two types of oppositional forces on the population, we can start to get a handle on the changes in the population size over time, the population dynamics. Specifically, we can say that the change in the number of individuals over a particular period of time, dn, over dt, is equal to the birth rate, which we symbolize with a b, minus the death rate, which we symbolize with a d. If there are more individuals being born and entering the population than dying and leaving the population, the population will be growing. Its numbers will be increasing. If those two values are equal, the population will be steady, and if the death rate is greater than the birth rate, the population will be declining. This is a basic way of thinking about what's happening in the dynamics of the population, but we can expand that to fit the population to observed mathematical models. The first is the exponential growth model, what a population would do if it could. If every member of a population successfully reproduces, over time the number of individuals will increase, but it will not be a linear increase. If the reproduction is a doubling, one individual will become two, two will become four, four will become eight, and so on and so on. That's exponential growth. And we can represent that by taking our prior population growth equation, dn over dt, and expressing it instead as r max times n, where r max is the maximum per capita growth rate. It's the maximum number of offspring that each member of the population could be contributing to the population in perfect condition. If the r max value is positive, the population will be an exponential increase in growth. If it is negative, the population will be in an exponential decrease in growth. And if it is zero, the population would be neither increasing or decreasing. And to look at this, let's look at some examples from three different bacterial populations, each of which doubles at different rates. The blue population has an R value of approximately 0.05. The red population has an R value of approximately 0.0375. And the green population at the bottom has an R value of approximately 0.025. Notice that in each case, the R value is positive, And in each case, the population is is increasing exponentially, they're simply doing it at different 
different rates because of their different positive R values. You can mathematically model this on your own and you will find out that if you continue exponential growth for a long enough time, in the case of a bacteria dividing every 20 minutes, after about a week, the population of that particular bacteria will occupy a mass equal to the entire mass of the Earth. That obviously is not what's going on in the real world, and that's because the exponential growth model is not taking into account limitations on population growth, which very much exist. And so that is our other model of population growth, the logistic growth model, which takes into account the limitations on population growth in a particular environment, what we call the carrying capacity, or the number of individuals of the population that can be sustained in a particular environment due to resource limitations. The logistic growth model is shown here for yeast up in the top graph and shown down in the bottom for a population of seals that was recovering from a period of extensive hunting. Notice that in each case there is a clear carrying capacity for these populations in their environments. The carrying capacity is symbolized as K and it's important to understand that it is not a fixed value. Particularly in a non-laboratory setting, the carrying capacity for any population in the environment is going to fluctuate from year to year or season to season as the amount of resources change as well, which helps explain the fluctuation around the average carrying capacity that you see in that seal graph, for instance. Taking the carrying capacity into effect, we can now modify our population growth equation once again so that dn over dt is now equal to r max times n multiplied by a value of the carrying capacity minus the current number of individuals in the population divided by the carrying capacity. As the number of individuals in the population remains low, the k minus n over k term in that equation remains close to 1, and as a result, the carrying capacity does not have a major effect on the growth rate of the population. But as the population numbers increase, that term becomes smaller and smaller until eventually the number of individuals equals the carrying capacity, and that term is reduced to 0. Of course, if the number of individuals was above the carrying capacity, that term would then become negative and population growth would decrease as a result. It's important to understand that these mathematical equations are models of population growth. In the real world, population growth is frequently a lot noisier than what we would see if we were simply modeling it mathematically using these equations. But these equations are still useful for us to analyze populations and see what kind of growth phase a population is in in its environment which can in turn help us anticipate future directions for the growth of those populations. When thinking about the things that limit population growth, we talk about limiting factors. Limiting factors come in two different varieties. There are density-dependent limiting factors. These are factors that exert a bigger effect as the density of the population, as the number of individuals in that particular area increases. What you can see in this graph is a density-dependent limiting factor in a population of C. elegans worms. As the number of individuals in the population increases, each individual worm produces fewer and fewer eggs. This is due to the population exhausting the various resources in this environment. Space, food, an increase in the amount of waste that they're producing, all of these things are working together to have this density-dependent limiting effect. There are also density-independent limiting factors. These are factors that have a limiting effect on a population regardless of the number of individuals in the population. This graph is showing the relationship between the density of a population, which you can see on the y-axis, and the size of the organisms that we're talking about. The larger the organisms are, the lower the density of the population of that organism in the environment. It doesn't matter how many individuals of the population there are in the environment, it's simply a function of the size of the individuals themselves. That's a density-independent factor. Together, density-dependent and density-independent factors are contributing to the carrying capacity for a particular population in its environment. Now that we have an understanding of the dynamics of populations, we can talk about the other ways that we study populations. One of the main ways is looking at the distributions of the individuals in the population. And it's important to understand that distributions can be considered in terms of their patterns in space. So are individuals uniformly distributed in the environment or are they randomly distributed or in clumped distributions? But they can also be expressed as patterns in time. So different populations, for instance, will have different patterns of survivorship, type one, type two, or type three, which describe the number of individuals from any one year that survive from year to year going forward into time. Both patterns in space and patterns patterns in time are useful for our own understandings of how the population is distributed, which of course will contribute to our understandings of the dynamics of the population more broadly. 
In terms of actually studying real-world populations, we do need to go out and collect data. And that can be done through direct sampling, by going into an environment and counting the number of individuals in the population, or by using tools to estimate the number of individuals based on the number of individuals that we observe. But we can also use mathematical modeling to study real-world populations based on the data that we take from the environment and our larger theoretical understandings of population growth. All of these processes are used by population biologists when studying populations. Populations. Which of course leads us to our next question of why should we even care to study population? This graphic may help to explain that. We see three different maps of species richness for three different major types of vertebrate organisms in North America. We have an amphibian diversity map, a bird diversity map, and a mammal diversity map. If we want to know which areas of North America are most suited to the life strategies of amphibians or birds or mammals or humans or anything else, we're going to need to be able to understand how those populations are distributed. That's a major reason why we study populations. The interactions among members of a population and the interactions among populations with other populations are major networks by which the larger functionings of the biosphere are accomplished. So if we're interested in those functionings, and we should be if we like to to breathe and eat and drink and live healthy lives, then we absolutely need to understand how the parts of those systems, the populations of individuals, are distributed and how they're interacting. We can also use this information to begin to understand trends in populations over time. This graphic shows data on the populations of jellyfish in recent studies of different regions of the Earth's oceans. Aside from the interesting and somewhat alarming notion that in a lot of areas on the planet the number of jellyfish are increasing, Jellyfish also are major predators of fish, and we like to eat fish as human beings. So by understanding what's happening with our jellyfish populations, we can start to get a handle on how that change in the jellyfish population may affect things like commercial fisheries, an industry that is incredibly valuable to many, many millions of people on the planet. And since I've just brought it up, let's talk about the human population specifically. The human population, as you can see in this graph, is in a period of exponential growth. In the history of the species on the planet, it is a relatively recent development. A hundred years ago, there were a slightly more than one billion people on the planet, and in the last 100 years, that population has increased more than seven times to the current population of more than seven billion people on the planet. Depending upon when you watch this video, that number may very well be distant history. But we can also see that our population growth is beginning to slow down. You can see the declining rates of human population growth in the graph that's directly above me. And one thing to notice is that these, these rates are not uniformly decreasing across all of the major regions of the planet. Some human populations are decreasing their growth at a rate that's greater than other populations are. This is really important if we want to be able to plan for an Earth that's going to have 8 or 9 or even 10 billion people on it. At 7 billion people, we're already beginning to stress the ecosystems of the Earth in significant and, I would argue, concerning ways. Getting an understanding on how our population is going to continue to grow or not into the future is a crucial part of being able to handle the increased demands of the human population on the ecosystems of the planet. Thanks so much for watching our discussion on populations. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can explain how populations increase or decrease in size. Make sure that you can compare and contrast the exponential and logistic models of population growth. Make sure you can describe how and why populations are studied in biology. And finally, make sure that you can explain the general trends in the human population and why we should care about them. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment here at the end and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.